Good morning. morning. How are you guys doing? Good. Great to see you. So glad that you're here with us at the McAllen campus of BT Church. Hope you had a great week and have had a great weekend. We're going to have a good time today uh, as we continue our Jesus is Better series. We started this thing back in January. We've got up until the middle of November before we uh, end it. And so we're going to continue on this morning. Before we move on, though, I do want to share some exciting news. Many of you Uh, If you've been around, you know that our Sherry Lane campus has been uh, joining us in McAllen or Edinburgh or even Alice some weeks, uh, the past several weeks as we have been uh, finishing a construction project for a new location. In fact, if you're uh, part of our Sherry Lane campus, that's the campus you normally attend, why don't you make some noise so we know that you're here with us today, Sherry Lane campus. So we started this project, honestly don't exactly remember when, it's been the, both the discussions and, and then the design process, but we started construction somewhere around the beginning of the summer, and uh, we're a few weeks delayed. This is my first uh, construction project as a pastor, but I've heard that sometimes you can anticipate those delays, so uh, we're a few weeks delayed, uh, but we are nearing the finish line, and so we should, let me emphasize the word should, we should complete the project this week. So, let me tell you what that means. You can go ahead. <clears throat> so, in our best efforts to have a plan moving forward, this is what we're going to do. To allow time to make sure that we get everything set up and ready to go for our first Sunday morning service, what we're going to do is we're going to hold off next Sunday, September 29th, but what we're going to do is a dedication service next Sunday evening at 6.30 p.m., and that's not just for BT Sherryland, that's for the BT Church family. Let's pack it out. Let's go ahead and, uh, and just kind of laugh at the fire code week one there, and because uh, there's not enough room for everybody, but we'll make it work. And so 6.30 p.m. next Sunday night, dedication service. There won't be any child care. We'll have everyone together in the worship center. We'll, we'll overflow it and go out into the lobby. Uh, we're going to worship a little bit and uh, break in the sound system. Uh, we're going to worship a little bit. We'll, we'll hear from, from Pastor Juan and maybe a few others. And then we'll, we'll close with a time of prayer there at the facility for the great things that God is going to do in that place. We'll pray for the ministry that's going to happen. We'll pray for those that don't yet know Jesus, but they're going to meet him in that room. And uh, so we're expecting big things. It'll be about an hour-long service. We know that you know, some of us will mingle around, and that's okay, but we'll plan 6.30 to 7.30. That way we can get out. And if you've got kids and you know, you've got school night stuff to get to. So why don't you plan to be with us uh, next Sunday night there in Sherryland, uh, the expressway and Benson right there. It says Heroes Dental. There's a building, Heroes Dental. We're the south end of that building. You'll see our sign. Um, and then the following Sunday, October 6th, uh, we'll begin the next chapter of BT Church and the BT Sherryland campus as we will have our first Sunday morning service there in our new location. Can we get excited for what the Lord is doing at our church? <clears throat> So again, hope you can join us uh, next weekend for the dedication service and BT Sherryland family. It has been so great having you uh, with us uh, back in McAllen and again, Edinburgh and Allison will enjoy another week uh, before we, it's almost like a relaunching before we go back out uh, and anticipate all the great things. God did so much uh, in our old location there uh, at the University of Phoenix building. I believe he's going to do even more than that here in this new location. That being said, why don't you grab your Bible and open up to Hebrews chapter 12. You heard me correct. One, two, not one, one, right? We have, yay. Come on now. That's not how you get listed in the heroes of faith. So So we spent eight, I'm just kidding. We spent eight weeks, eight weeks in chapter 11, this list, this narrative of these amazing men and women of the faith. And so today we transition out of chapter 11 into chapter 12, looking at verses one, two, and three. And we're going to talk this morning about what does it mean to run the race of faith? What does it mean to run the race of faith? 
of faith. I'm not a big fan of running. It's just not real high on my list of activities I enjoy. Um, you know, my, my wife recently wanted to start exercising again. And uh, so I was like, yeah, let's go to the gym. She's like, no, let's run. I was like, why does it have to be an us thing? Like that needs to be. So I've, I've been running with my wife for about the past month or so. But you know, when I was in high school, my sophomore year of high school, uh, I was told I was going to be on the track team. And I want to emphasize the word told, okay? Um, I was playing football, and uh, one of my coaches told me in offseason, hey, you're going to be on the track team. I was like, nah, coach, I don't really, really want to do it. He's like, no, no, you're going to be on the track team. And so uh, they wanted me to be working out with the track team and whatever. And so he's like, I don't care if you do track meets. You're just going to run and, and stay in shape and I was like, all right, that's fine. And so uh, I was pulling a track team. Now, growing up in Alice, Texas, one high school, um, everything kind of revolved uh, around the, the football team. And so here's the reality. Every male coach coached football, and then some of them had other sports that they coached as well. They're, we didn't have a track coach, okay? We had a football coach that, that met with all the people who ran in circles and kind of made sure we were doing something. So I go to my first track practice, and I, I'm talking to the coach, and I had done you know, track as a kid, but I didn't do it in middle school or my freshman year because, I, again, I don't like running. And, and so he's like, well, what do you want to do, Dupree? What, what event? And I was like, I don't know, coach. And he's like, well, let me see. Uh, you know, it wasn't a, a big school. We didn't have all the events covered. He's like, let me see where I got some holes. He's like, I need someone to do the 110 hurdles. I said, like, coach, I ain't doing the hurdles. I'm like, I've ne- no, no. <laughs> Keep going. And so process elimination, I ended up getting assigned the 800 meter race, okay? And I don't know how much you know about track, but 800 meters is a death sentence, okay? Um, it's too long to sprint, right? It's not like 100 meters or 200, even a 400 meter. If you don't know anything about track, 400 is one lap, okay? But it's also not a distance race. It's not like a mile or a two mile where you kind of pace yourself. Like, it's just go out there and try to die. Like, that's what you do. <laughs> Just kind of see how it works. I, I, I think Satan invented it right after cats, but anyways. <laughs> if you get cats running the 800, it's the epitome of evil, but anyways. <laughs> or a really good YouTube video, but anyways. So, so I get the 800, right? And here's the deal. I go to my very first track meet. And again, because our track coach wasn't an actual track. Now, he did his best, but he didn't actually know a lot about track. He just had us doing some workouts. And so for a few weeks, I'm working out and, you know, just running. And then I go to my very first track meet. And at this point in time, I haven't really cared about practice, right? I mean, we're talking about practice, right? And, and so some of you got that. And so I, I go to the first track meet, and I'm in my lane for my preliminary heat. And the gun goes off, and I just start running. I mean, and I'm smoking everybody. I'm like, this stuff's easy, you know? And I finish my first quarter, and, and, and people are way behind me, but then, then my fuel tank ran out. And I don't think it's possible, but I think I got lapped in the 800, actually. And, and, and so here's the deal. I got dead last. Now, I don't know if you know this about me. I'm a little bit competitive, right? And it's not always a good thing, just being real honest. I'm a little bit competitive. And so suddenly I cared, right? I went through two or three weeks of practice not caring, but then I just got smoked in a race, and suddenly I cared. Well, I only had one week to the next track meet, so now at, at track practice, I'm kind of paying attention to what my times are, and I'm trying to, you know, get better. And so the next week, it's a large track meet. And in the 800, there was more runners than lanes. There's eight lanes on the track. We had, I think, 16. I think we had two in every lane. And so it's pre-race, and you know, I'm kind of getting loose, and I don't really have a strategy. I, I know I'm not going to come out sprinting. And so, you know, I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do. And the guy in the lane with me, man, he's just like jabber jaws in my ear. Hey, what's your best time? I'm like, I don't know. I've ran this thing once, man. <laughs> he's like, well, how'd you do? I was like, yeah. Some people did better than me, but, you know. <laughs> so he's just going. So I just decided right then, competitive juices kick in, and I'm like, I don't care what place I get. I'm beating this guy. <laughs> I, I don't need a time. I just got to beat him. And so this is what happened. The, the, the gun goes off, and I'm really paying attention to him. And I don't remember. I didn't make the finals. I didn't, you know, place in my prelim. But I think I got fifth place in that heat. You know what place he got? Sixth. And I realized something. I realized this might work for me. And so it was a, a few weeks later, and I was in another track. I mean, what began to happen is I would just line up in my, in my lane, and I would look around in my heat, and I would be like, I'm going to beat that guy. Yeah. I, I would be like, hey, his ankle looks a little swollen. That's, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that guy's running in flats. Okay, so. Uh, but I would just pick someone. Like, I'm, I, in my head, I mean, it was, it was not smart teenage pride. I'm going to beat that guy. 
And, and so it was a few weeks later, and, and the guy that I cited I was going to beat got third place. So you know what? I got second place. And my sophomore year, by the time we got to the district track meet, the guy that I, and, and again, it was random. I, did, I honestly didn't know who was going to be good or not. But the guy that I said at the beginning of the race that I was going to beat um, got second, and I beat him. And, and so here's the thing that happened to me. As much as I didn't enjoy running track, I reached this point where, you know, I wanted to do it well, right? Like if you're going to run, then run to win. And here's the thing. When we accept Christ as our Savior, like it or not, we all enter the race of faith. Everyone is enlisted. Everyone's on the track. Everyone is running. And here's the deal. We should want to run well. Now, you don't need to look across the room like, I'm going to beat that dude in the race. Like, that's not... <laughs> But there is a principle that says, I do want to run well. I do want to care. I, I do want to finish well. I want to lean into the tape and strive towards the goal of Jesus. And I want to run the race well. And Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1, 2, and 3, give us a little bit of insight in how we can run well. So let's take a look at the text today. Again, Hebrews chapter 12, starting in verse 1, it says this. Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the source and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so that you won't grow weary and give up. Let's pray. Father, this morning I pray you open our hearts and minds to receive from you, God. Father, I pray today for every person here, no matter where they are on the spectrum of faith, that all of us would anticipate to receive a word. Father, for those that have been in the faith for decades and that have been in church for years, let us believe that today there is something fresh for us that we haven't arrived, that we haven't yet finished the race, that there's more for us to experience. Father, for those that are struggling in their faith because of something outside of them, financial distress, health issues, Father, I pray that you would lift those burdens today for those that are struggling in the faith with internal things, relational strife, feelings of despair and depression. God, I pray that you would reign supreme in those things. God, I pray for those that are battling sin issues, for those that are, that are not walking the steps of obedience you're calling them to, that today would be a new leaf. Today would be a memorial stone of taking faith steps. And God, I pray today for the person who is listening right now in this room, in overflow, or even online. And the truth is you have not captured their heart yet. They have not surrendered their life to you and received King Jesus, you to be their Savior. I pray today is that day of salvation, that today eternity is rewritten for them. And God, I pray that all of this is for your glory and for the joy of your church. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, here we go. Let's go ahead and get to business here. In, Hebrew, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, I want to point out that the very first word we see there is the word therefore. Now, let me say that there's a principle called biblical interpretation. And biblical interpretation is when we read God's word and we, we, we seek to understand the meaning that is already supplied. Just, just so you know, you should not read God's word and try to supply the meaning. It's already there. We shouldn't gather and be like, well, this means this to me and this means this to you. We, we should strive for the, the application, right, may flesh itself out, but we should strive to know the meaning that God intended there in his word. And so there's a discipline of biblical interpretation. And here's an easy little tool for you to take away. Anytime you are reading the Bible and you come across the word therefore, you should ask yourself, what's it there for? Right? What's it there for? Romans chapter 8, verse 1, great example. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I love Romans chapter 8. I think it is rich with the gospel. Romans chapter 8 starts with the fact that there's no condemnation in Jesus, and it ends with the fact that there's no separation. But if you really want to unlock the weight of Romans chapter 8, go back and read Romans chapter 5, 6, and 7, because then you'll find out what the therefore is there for, right? Clear as mud? Awesome. Okay. You guys worry me. I'm going to preach over here for a little bit. So, Here's the deal. 
So Hebrews 12.1, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, what's the therefore? Therefore, remember the book of Hebrews is actually a letter. It wasn't written with chapter and verse. So in the body of the letter, the author has just finished this narrative list, this story list of amazing men and women of the faith. Hey, remember Enoch and remember Noah and re- remember, you know, remember Abel and Cain and, 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 and remember Moses and remember Remember Rahab and Jephthah and Barak. Remember the people that I don't even have time to listen to, to, to list their names. Remember the people who, who put foreign armies to flight. Remember those people who by faith shut the mouths of lions. And while you're at it, remember the people that got sawn in two. Like, I, I, sign me up for, you know, shutting lions' mouths, right? And re- remember the people who, who were tortured and who, who went around li- living in animal skins, right? Remember all these heroes of faith. And as you remember, therefore, because you're surrounded by this great cloud of witnesses, these heroes of the faith, what chapter 12 is is doing is the transition goes from remember these to now you go run. Right? You, You remember these people that have gone before you. And as you remember, now it's your turn. You go run. And as this persecuted group of believers received this letter, it was true for them, just like it's true for you and I. Now let's go run. Let's go run this race. And so how do we run well the race of faith? Here's four things. Here's the first one. If you want to run the race of faith well, start by looking to godly examples. Start by looking to godly examples. Again, verse one states it plainly. Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, because of all these heroes of the faith, We have them in scripture. You hopefully have them in your life as well. Look to godly examples. Growing up uh, in the in the 90s, being a middle school student in the early 1990s, I remember a Gatorade commercial that I loved. Gatorade commercial had a song that played throughout the entire length of the commercial, and the the hook or the chorus of the song went like this: I want to be like Mike, right? I want to be, I want to be, I want to be like Mike. What Mike was Gatorade talking about? Michael Jordan, right? And so in the commercial, it would show uh, images of or, or video clips of Michael Jordan dunking a basketball with his tongue out, and then the next scene would be a 12-year-old kid dribbling with his tongue out. And I want to be like Mike. And what was the commercial saying? It was saying that because Michael Jordan is a great man, no, no, because Michael Jordan is the greatest basketball player that's ever played, okay? What about LeBron? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the fact that your argument about LeBron always ends with this. Well, what if he does that? Well, he ain't done it yet. All right. So currently Michael Jordan's still the best. And so anyways, and so the commercial was saying, if you want to be a great basketball player, strive to be like Michael Jordan, but Gatorade didn't, didn't create the idea because the apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, Follow me as I follow Christ. Be imitators of me as I imitate Christ Jesus. Jesus is the goal, but we should have people that we look to that help us towards that goal. Look to godly examples. I want you to take a minute and think in your life, who are the godly examples that you look to? And by the way, I don't care if you've been in the faith for one year or for 100 years, you never reach the point in time where you don't need to look to godly examples. But but here's the other side of the coin. Because running the race of faith isn't just that we look to godly examples, but that we be godly examples worth looking to. To run well, you run looking towards those examples, but you also run being an example worth looking to. Beloved, the bottom line is how we live our lives actually matters. What you do outside of here matters. And then I've said it before, and I'm not trying to be, you know, the bearer of bad news, but it doesn't matter what you do in here regarding how, how expressive you are in worship. If your outside life never matches your inside the worship center attitudes, then there's a disconnect. And you say, well, I don't know that anybody's looking to me. There's someone looking to you. I promise if you're a parent, you definitely have someone looking to you. In your workplace, in your schools, students, there are people that are looking to you. Are you an example worth looking at? Are you pointing people in the right direction? We look to examples. We look to godly examples as we live our lives as godly examples as well. 
I remember when I was in high school on that dreaded track team, one of my least favorite parts outside of the running part was the fact that because I was on the track team and we had track practice after school, I had to be in the weight room before school at 5.30 a.m. I was like, coach, you're the one that made me run track. Why do I got to be here at 5.30? And so I had to be in the weight room at 5.30 for football to work out. And so my dad would wake me up like at 5.15 because we live close to the school. I wasn't driving yet. I just had to put on some clothes and brush my teeth and I was there. I showered at school, right? And so every morning during the off season of my sophomore year of high school, my dad would pop his head in my room. He had showered. He was already done. If you want to know if my mom was a saint, by the way, she raised four sons and, and she raised my dad. But uh, she, there was five, five males and one female in a house with one bathroom. She, she was a saint, okay? And, and so my dad would come and he would wait. He would put his, he would pop his head into my, my bedroom and every morning without fail, Monday through Friday, open at him. I'm like, oh, I hate open at him. <laughs> it's like the old marimba alarm on the iPhone. It's like, oh, I'm going to be up and at you, old man. And so I would get up and I didn't have to shower because I was, but, but I would go brush my teeth. And without fail, I honestly can't remember this not being the case. I would go to the bathroom and I would brush my teeth. And as I would walk back to my room to put on my clothes to go work out, I would pass the living room. And every morning, Monday through Friday at 520 in the morning, I would look in the living room and my dad would be in his chair with his Bible open and a yellow legal pad writing notes. 15 years old, I didn't think twice about it. But I think today about why is my dad one of my spiritual heroes, my, my primary spiritual hero? Why? Well, there's so many things that I don't have time to talk about. His boldness with his faith. He was an evangelist to the town of Alice. But one of the things I think about now at my stage of life, being 40 years old with a 13, 11, 9, and 7-year-old, is I am thankful that I can recall numerous times passing my dad in the Word. And I don't want my kids to know, well, he's a pastor, so he reads the Bible. I want to force myself, and i got to do better, I want to force myself not just to be reading the Word, but to be reading it in front of them, that they can see me at the table or in my bedroom or in the living room with my Bible open so that when they reach that point where they're wrestling with whether or not they should open the Word of God, they can at least say, well, I know Dad did it. Beloved, you need to have examples you look to, but you need to know people are indeed looking to you. Are you an example that is worth following? The next thing, the text goes on to say that we, we don't just look to godly examples, but we lay aside weight and sin. Again, let us lay aside every hindrance or weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. If we're going to run the race well, we've got to lay aside the things that slow us down, right? Plain and simple. You want to run a race well, you've got to lay aside the things that slow you down. The author gives two examples, weight or hindrance and sin. Well, what's the difference? I'm glad you asked. Weight in this context, weight are things that are not necessarily sinful, but they're also not necessarily helpful. Weights can, th th there are things in our lives that can be weights in one season of life, that can lead another season, it's not a weight. It weights many times can be more insidious than the sin in our lives because the weights can be things we don't want to acknowledge, we don't want to admit, and we don't want to let go of. Examples, social media. It's actually not sinful. Hard to believe, right? It's actually not sinful. But how much time does it take away from you? What does it create inside of you when you see everyone's perfect life? Does it create envy? Does it create a lack of gratitude for what God has given you? 2020 is right around the corner. 2020 is an election year. Let me say this. I believe you should be informed and I believe you should vote. But let me say this also, believer. If you can't be like Jesus, what you put on social media when it comes to your political opinion, get off social media. Well, what I post Jesus would agree with, he might agree with the premise, but he probably doesn't agree with the way you do it. Social media. Television. I'm not the guy coming for your television. I'm not that bad. I'm going to go home and watch football, all right? But, but how much time is devoted? What, what are we watching? You know, there, there's, this, there's this tension in the church as a pastor where I, I don't want to be the next Pharisee preaching legalism. I'm not going to tell you what kind of movies or music or television shows you should watch, but I do think there should be some filter that you're applying. 
And if you're like, well, should I not watch R-rated movies? I, I'm not going to tell you that that's for you to figure out with the Lord, but you should go read Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, and use it as your lens. And what's it say? Go read it. I'm not going to tell you. But it talks about things being excellent and of good, re- good, good rapport, right? L- okay, L- let, me, let me try to drive this home before I move on to sin. If you have an iPhone, I want you to take it out right now. If, if I, for real, everybody. All okay, Brian Jones is walking around. He's looking for people that don't take their phones out. He, he's going to shoot you with a blow dart, all right? <laughs> take out your iPhone. If you, if you didn't take out an iPhone because you have something else, go to the store and get an iPhone later. You'll thank me. <laughs> and Jesus looked to the Android users and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. <laughs> All right, here we go. I'm just kidding. I'm, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Come, come back. Come back. I got to get... All right. So you got your iPhone, your iPad. You got something out. I want you to find your utilities app. It's the one with a little gear on it. Tap it. Okay. That screen will, will have to be... At the top, it'll say your name, right? And then about nine down on the list of icons, you'll see a purple hourglass, and it says screen time. Now, you may not have updated your phone. If you don't have that, update your phone. Come on, let's stay with us. All right, so screen time. I want you to tap screen time. The next screen should have at top the name of your phone, right? Like Omar's iPhone. Um, For me, I I named my phone Big Brother. That way, when people try to airdrop, they know that I'm always watching. But anyway, so (laughs) it says Big Brother, right? And then it will show you the amount of minutes you have been on your phone today. But if you look, there's a little arrow. So tap that little arrow icon pointed to the right, and it now says today, but if next to it says last seven days. Tap last seven days. And now you see your average time on that device per day. If you scroll up, you'll see which apps you spent the most time on. If you keep going, it says pickups. And that gives you the average number of times that week or each day that week, you actually picked up your phone. It's pretty informative, right? How many notifications you got? By the murmuring and the look on some of your faces, I think we already know our next steps for some of us. All right, so I want you to do, I want you to to get, get, get out of settings, go back to your home screen, shut down your device, and put it away. I'm preaching, come on. You're doing with your phones up. All right. Here's the deal. An iPhone is not inherently evil. But in all honesty, some of us don't need to wait for the invitation to know what our next step is. Is what you just saw helpful in your race of faith? Chris, I know I should read the word. I know I should have a quiet time. I know I should pick up that New Morning Mercies book. I know you say it only takes five minutes, but I don't even know where I've got five minutes. Well, did your phone just say that you average like 70 pickups a day? We can't do that one time? Every other day? Did your phone just tell you that somewhere between one, two, three, four, five hours a day are spent on it? I'm going to be real candid with you. I I, I strive to try to be practical when I preach. I'm I'm serious. There may be some people, and your next step today is after lunch to go to your cell phone provider store and not trade in or get rid of your iPhone. Remember, a wait can be a wait for a season. iPhones are not evil. They they can be great tools. But based on some, maybe the, the, the usage that we're doing and what we're using with that smart device, maybe you need to go to your cell phone store and buy that $40 or $50 flip phone and use that for a month. I bet you don't pick it up 80 times a day. (laughs) Then there's a premise here. This is what weight does. It's not inherently sinful, so we think it's it's not that bad. And we get a little fired up when people want to take our weights away. I like what John Piper says. He's a longtime pastor and author of multiple books. And John Piper says this, If we want to run the race of faith well, we need to stop asking, is this or that wrong? And we need to start asking, will this or that help me run my race for Jesus? And so I ask you, what in your life do you need to evaluate? And just honestly ask, does it help me? Does it help me run the race for Jesus? Wait, sin. Sin's a little bit easier, right? Sin is obvious disobedience. It is walking contrary to the Spirit. It is the willful choice of disobedience. Sin can be easier to spot The text says that it clings to us. It gets its hooks in us. I know some of us, maybe we're discouraged because 
Uh, we've received Jesus as Savior some time ago, but we feel like we're still struggling with the same sin. I want you to hear me today, and I hope this is encouraging. When, when, when we're tempted as believers, and we still are, but when we're tempted and even when we give in to sin, understand that that power is outside of you, not inside of you. Because when you receive Jesus, the Holy Spirit fills you up. That's why we say Jesus comes to live in our hearts. Therefore, sin and Satan no longer can reside in us. And so you receive Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit fills you up. The temptation of sin and the power is real, but it's on the outside pressing in on you. Inside of you is the power to resist. Well, then the question we have to ask is, sometimes why, why are we not very successful in resisting? Why, why do I go back to those old habits? And let me just share with you something that burdens my heart as a pastor. I believe as we are becoming a more and more politically correct society and true inside the church, what happens inside the church is that when we become politically correct, we stop calling sin, sin. And we preach feel-good topics, and we don't say things like, if you do not repent of your sins and receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you will indeed spend eternity apart from him in hell. That, like, you can't say that anymore, right? But, but what bothers me is that What's, I think, being bred inside of many churches is a culture where we acknowledge that there is sin, but we just practice sin management. Look, I'm doing better. And we're okay with that. Now, it is a journey and a battle, but we've become a people many times that we're okay with the answer of the, when it comes to the sin in our life. Well, I'm doing better. And we're just managing it because somewhere along the way, we have started to believe that our sins are a pet that we can control and not a power seeking to destroy us. Well, hey, man, how's it going with your battle with internet pornography? Well, I'm not looking any day, every day, I'll just a few times a week. It's better. John Owens, the late theologian, said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. It is, a, it is a journey and it is a process and we do need to have compassion and grace with each other, but we need to be willing to fight the fight. Beloved, hear me, sin is not a pet. The truth is, if you've got sin in your life and you're okay with it, here's preacher honesty, I don't know what to tell you. If you're living in habitual sin and you're okay with it, the only thing I can say to you is you need to make sure you're saved, that you indeed know Jesus. It's not, it's not a pet. Your pride is not a pet that you can control. Your lust and your greed, the lies. It's not pets, it's power. And hear me clearly, beloved, your sin will always lie about your future. It will always lie about your future and it will always take you farther than you are willing to go. Well, you don't understand, Chris. At home, she just doesn't understand me anymore. She doesn't listen to me. She just, she just nags and nags and nags. She doesn't touch me. She doesn't look at me the same way. But this person, this lady at work, at the gym, Sometimes, unfortunately, this lady at church, she notices me and she values me. And God doesn't want me to be in this setting where I'm so miserable. Well, maybe you should work on the misery in that setting. And I know that I'll be happy if I, if I make this transition and if I split my family. I, sin is lying to you about the future. How do I know that sin will take you farther than you want to go? Ask any addict. There's not a person with an addiction that the first time they looked at that pornography, because that's an addiction, or they took that substance, they said to themselves, boy, I hope I do this every day, and I hope I spend you know, endless dollars on this. No one does that. Someone believed the lie that that would help them feel better. Let's, let's not practice sin management. Let's put it to death. So, some of us are here today, and the truth is you're frustrated with where you are spiritually. You want to advance in your race. You want to feel closer to the Lord. But what's preventing you is weight and sin that you're not doing business with. And I promise you, if you will take steps today to shed that weight and to unhook that sin, you will start to experience the growth that you so desperately long for. You want to run the race well? Lay aside weight and sin. What else? Run with endurance. Run with endurance. The author goes on to say, let us run with endurance. Huh, there's the point. The race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus. Let us run with endurance. This is the author's way of saying, don't give up. 
I know that it gets hard. I know that, that sometimes you, you get that runner's cramp and you just want to double over. And you know, my, Again, I said my wife and I have started running, and there are times when we are running and we, you know, we don't talk, we don't acknowledge each other's presence. We got ear, uh, AirPods in, like, and we're just, you know, the only thing I acknowledge is that I'm going to beat her, right? Because there's only one person I'm running with. And so, um, <laughs> and, and, so, and so there's times that we're running, and in my head I'm like, just stop running. Just stop. Just walk. Walking's good. You know? And this battle rages inside of me. I don't know what I mean. I'm just like, oh. And I'm just telling just, just keep, just run to the next light post. Then you'll stop. And I get, no, just run to the next one. I play all these weird head games, guys. <laughs> run till this song ends, you know? And here's the the author is acknowledging that there are times in the race of faith where we want to quit. But he says, but run with endurance. I like the way that Paul says it when he speaks to the church in Philippi. He says in chapter 3, verse 12, I do not consider myself to have taken hold of it, this goal of his. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and, and reaching forward to what is ahead, I pursue as my goal the prize promised by God's heavenly call in Christ Jesus. He says, I strive, I lean into that tape, I keep running. One of the things that drives me crazy about preachers is when we make it sound like, or we even say, because some do, that following Jesus is easy. I pray I never say that to you. And I'm just saying, if you're on the fence and you're not sure you haven't made a decision to trust Christ, I don't believe in fine print evangelism. It's not easy. It involves self-sacrifice. Like, oh, you shouldn't say that on the front end. Why? I want people to know. But as much as it's not easy, it is the greatest life available. Beloved, there is, there is a difference between something being simple and something being easy. Walk in obedience, simple to understand, not always easy to do, because the funny thing is taking up my cross daily is a struggle. Denying myself daily is a struggle. I want to lift myself up and prop myself up. I want to make sure that I am not taken advantage of. I want to make sure that I'm recognized. I, I want to do things for me, but I've got to run with endurance. And while it may be difficult, it is attainable. How do I know? Because the power of the Holy Spirit inside of me. I can't run this race without Jesus. But when I recognized my need for a Savior and called upon him, he filled me up. And so when I want to double over and quit running, I have actually inside of me the power to keep going. I can run with endurance. I look to those examples. I, I shed that weight in sin and I keep going. And then I remember that many times when I want to give up and I want to stop, it's pro- partly because, if not totally because, I've become a little bit me-centered. A lot of times when I want to quit the race of faith, it's because I feel like I'm not getting what I deserve. I like the, the pastor from California, Rick Warren, in 2005, he wrote a little book called Purpose Driven Life. You might have heard of it. He sold a few copies, about 50 million. <laughs> Chapter one, page one, line one, Purpose Driven Life. It's not about you. Some of us need to hear this day. You're struggling to run the race, and one of the reasons why you're struggling is you keep looking to the runners next to you. You know one of the number one rules in track? Keep your eyes forward. Someone needs to hear this day. You, you need to run your race, beloved. Well, I'm trying. I'm, I'm in church. I'm doing, but this, you know, this person at work, I've been at work for five years and I haven't got one promotion. This person's been there five months. They've already passed me. They're earning more. They're getting recognized more. I'm actually doing the work. They're getting the recognition. Is that difficult? Absolutely it is. I wish it wasn't the case. I'm trying to live my life in a godly manner. All my friends are getting married and having kids. I'm still single. Run your race, beloved. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Run, run with in endurance, run your race. There's actually a biblical example of this. When, when Jesus reinstates Peter, remember Peter, the disciple who was like, I'll never deny you. And then he's standing by a fire like, I don't even know that dude, man. What are you talking about? And then the rooster crows, remember that story? You with me? All right, good. So, so Peter, he gets reinstated by Jesus, right? Jesus is grace. You're never too far from being used by Jesus. And so Jesus reinstates him, right? It's the whole, they're eating breakfast, you love me, feed my sheep. And then later on in the conversation, Jesus 
tells Peter, he says, look, there's going to come a point in time where you used to go wherever you wanted, but there'll come a point in time where people are going to lead you where you don't want to go. Jesus is foreshadowing the fact that Peter would bring glory to God through his death because Peter would be crucified much like Jesus was. This is the news Peter is getting. He's like, hey, you want to get back in the band? All right, here's the deal. You're going to die, right? And so he, he's saying this to Peter, and Peter looks across the way, and there's John, the author of the letter, and, and the one, uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And Peter's getting this news. He's like, okay, that's me, but what about that guy, Jesus? And in my own version, right, my own paraphrase of the Bible, if you read the text, it doesn't go just like this, but I think Jesus, he looks over to John and looks back to Peter, and basically his response is, what's it to you? If I want this guy to sit at my right hand, and I, and I want you to be crucified for my glory. What, what's it to you? Beloved, sometimes don't we, aren't we guilty of wanting to be the center of the solar system? I, I, I want the right hand. <laughs> John, John died in exile on the island of Patmos. Like, that may not be the best, but it sure is better than crucifixion. Run, run, run your race. Because in that endurance and in those difficult steps where you feel like you can't go any farther, it's in those moments that you build that ability to run well. And that's when you unlock John chapter 10, verse 10. It is not all, 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 all terrible news. There is life to the fullest. And it's found when we find our satisfaction in King Jesus. And here's the last thing. How do we actually do all this? When I really want to give up, how do I keep running? Well, you, you keep your focus on Jesus. The author says, let us fix our eyes, keep our eyes on Jesus, the source or author, perfect of our faith, for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross and despised the shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself so, to, so that you won't grow weary and give up. Beloved, Jesus is the standard. He's the goal. He's what we look to. We've got a cloud of witnesses. We've got godly examples, but he's ultimately what we long for to be like. It's who we long to look like. I love what the text says. It says, keep your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the, the source, the author and perfecter of our faith for the joy set before him. It says he endured the cross, despising the shame. I love to quote it, but if we're honest, a lot of us are like, I don't even know what that means. Like enduring the cross, scorning, despising the shame. Let, let me kind of break this down real quick. Jesus knew exactly what was in front of him. You see, crucifixion was the most humiliating form of death. In fact, it was viewed so lowly that a Roman citizen could not be crucified. Crucifixion was a form of execution below Roman citizenship. So a Roman citizen sentenced to death would not be crucified. It was physically agonizing. It was mentally, emotionally, and spiritually humiliating. Jesus knew what was in front of him. That's why he prays in the garden, Father, let this cup pass from me. But ultimately, the author of Hebrews says that for the joy, you know, don't miss that, right? For the joy set before him, what joy? Obedience to the Father. For the joy set before him, he embraced, he endured the cross. And what does it mean that he despised the shame? What that means is that when he considered the humiliation that would come with the cross, and then he compared that to disregarding the Father in disobedience, he said, it's not even a question, I'll despise that shame. I will embrace the race the Father has called me to run because it's not worth considering my reputation, my humiliation when it comes to disregarding the will of the Father. And what that says to me, beloved, this week God has wrecked my heart because I recognize how many times I am Chris-centered. How does this affect me and my world? How does this, Father, how, what you want me to do, God? What do I kind of, what's the benefit? How does it affect me? What's it cost me? But oh, that I would disregard those things so that I would not disregard the Father. And yes, Jesus was humiliated and he breathed a final breath and a body was taken off of the cross and placed in a tomb. But if you join us for our 2020 Israel tour, what you will find is that body is actually not still in that tomb. Because unlike any other religious system, when you study the hero of our faith, you won't find his dead body because three days after they put him in the tomb, he rose in victory and he stands as the conquering king today. And so, yes, it gets hard. You better believe it does. But for the joy set before us, 
that we have an eternity promised free of these things. Let us not disregard the Father, but endure the race he has called us to run. Because you and I, you know what? We'll never have the title of conquering king, but because Jesus has conquered, he lets us be called more than conquerors. Over, overcomers. He has fought the victory so that we can walk in it. And if God can take the cross and the shame that was associated with it and flip it upside down for his glory and for our joy, I'm not making light of your difficult situations, but what can he do with those things? What can he do with the things that we're asked to embrace and endure in our race? How can he use that for his glory and for our joy? The only way we stay faithful is keeping our eyes on the prize that is Christ Jesus. Everything that sin and Satan and death threw at God, their worst, their best, whatever you want to call it, it was not enough. He has plans. He doesn't waste anything. He doesn't waste our joy. He doesn't waste our suffering. Let's run the race well. Let's lean into the finish line. And what does that mean for me, Chris? What do I do? I don't know. We all probably have different things we need to do, but let me give you a few things quickly. Some of us, we need to start looking to godly examples while we are being godly examples. And to increase your game, you need to increase your community. Decide today that the next time you're going to join us won't be four weeks from now. Find a community group. Well, none of them work for me. Then start one. You got something going on in your life, some grief, you, you got some substances you're still struggling with, maybe you come on Thursday night to H2O, hope, heal, and overcome. Increase your community. Evaluate the weight in your life. What, what are those things? Are there some things you need to lay aside for right now? Evaluate the sin. Do business with sin. In just a moment, we're going to have ministers that will line this altar. And you can come, and I know it's scary, but you can say those sin struggles that you're dealing with that no one knows. Quit believing you'll do it in your own power, because if you could, you would have. It's the power of the Spirit in you, and it's the weapon of community through you. Maybe you need to come forward in a moment. You need to bring some of those things out into the light. Maybe running with endurance for some of us, it's going to be figuring out that next step. I already talked about community groups or H2O. Maybe for someone, your next step is going to be serving. You're not going to just come and sit anymore. I'm glad you're here, by the way. You're not going to just come and sit. You're going to, you're going to start serving in our kids' ministry or as a greeter or in our info center, you're going to host that community group, serve the student ministry. You're going, to, you're going to start serving. Maybe you're going to move from just attending this church to being a covenant member, to signing up for that membership class and figuring out how you can pour yourself out, not what you can get necessarily poured into you. Maybe your next step is trusting God with the tithe. Oh, here he goes. Here he goes. You will never know the full benefit of the victory of Jesus if he never has your full heart. And he'll never have your full heart if he doesn't have your wallet. I've said this before, and it's, an on, it, 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 it's a standing offer, by the way. If you're currently not tithing, 10% of your, of, your, of your income, which is given to you by the Lord, you're giving it to the local church for kingdom purposes. And hear me, it's not about the church. It's not, oh, we need your money. I am so thankful I don't have to preach that way. You need him. God's got us. If you have never practiced the tithe, then I'm challenging you today. Stop by one of our offering boxes, give online, start next week. You got to pray about it. Okay, pray about it. I think God's going to say do it. But anyways, <laughs> start tithing and do it for three months. And I know, I know if you're not doing it, how am I going to make ends? I get it. I don't have those answers. But do it for three months. And I'm serious. At the end of three months, if you feel like your life is actually worse than it was before you started, contact me. We will look in the records and we will refund every penny you gave us. No questions asked. No, no shame. I'm not worried about it. Like God's faithful. We have received letters in our offering baskets about God's faithfulness when people took the tithing challenge. Start now in three months. If you honestly think you're in a worse place, just contact it. You don't want to talk to me, talk to an elder, talk to any staff member 
and we will find out what you gave. Not me. I don't know what anybody gives. I don't want to know. But someone will find out what it was, and you'll get reimbursed. Maybe the next step is that you join this, this list, this cloud of witnesses that we've been surrounded by, that in, that in nine weeks, 92 people have gone public with their faith. That in, that in nine weeks, some 90 people through the ministry of this church and outside these walls have given their lives to Jesus as Savior. Look, I, I don't want to manufacture things, but, but we, were gonna, we had a baptism at 9 a.m. We were going to have one at 11 a.m., and I don't exactly know what happened. person couldn't make it. Or, but I just, I just think that means someone else is going to do it. See, everyone who gets baptized, they get one of these shirts. And someone was going to wear this today. That person isn't here. I still believe this shirt's going to get worn, though. I still believe it. And so maybe today, your next step in the race of faith, the way that you will run with endurance, is going public with your faith. Or maybe for someone, the way that you will go public is going to be actually getting in the race. The truth is you're sitting there and you don't even know if you're in the race yet. You don't know that you have Jesus in your heart. You don't know that if your day was today to face eternity, that you would indeed be welcomed into heaven. But you can know it's not difficult. It is confessing Jesus as Savior, believing he died in your place and that he rose again, and you ask him to come into your heart and save you. And today can be that day. I'm going to ask our ministers to go ahead and come forward right now. And as they make their way up, up to the front, let me ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. I'm not going to drag this out. We got to go. And so real simple, you may want to come forward for prayer today. You may want to come forward to confess some things that are going on in your heart. But maybe for one person, maybe today is the day that you want to walk in obedience. And even though you know you know Jesus, you haven't been obedient in baptism, maybe it's today, today's the day you want to do that. Or maybe today is the day that you want your eternity transformed because today is the day that you're going to receive salvation through Jesus Christ. If you think your next step is either baptism or, or for, for the first time in your life receiving Jesus as Savior, if you think either of those steps is your next step, I want you to raise your hand real quick. Head bowed, eyes closed. Just raise it up real quick and keep it up for a second so I can see you. And Father, I pray that in this moment of response that you would reveal in our hearts the steps that have to be taken, that God, you would work in a way that would draw us to decision, that God, today you would do things that are unexplainable outside of your power and your work in our lives. We pray this for your glory and for our joy in Jesus' name, amen.